All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, and welcome to this session on Cohort in a Box. We will be uh, hopefully answering your questions about what do we mean by Cohort in a Box and uh, getting some input from you during the Q&A at the end of this. A uh, very quick introduction, I'm David Glazer. The, I work at Verily as the CTO for the Terra platform, and I work uh, on the All of Us Data and Research Center as a PI there, and Shimon? Hi everyone, I'm Shimon Rura. I'm a product manager at Verily and I work with David on the Terra team as well as on the uh, researcher workbench for the All of Us Research Program. Next slide, please. So what we want to do today is talk about this concept that has come up in talking with some of you and a bunch of other people around IHCC around, is it possible to share the expertise and knowledge that some cohort programs have built, the, the return on the investment that some of the programs have built to help other cohort programs streamline their path to cohort success. Next slide. And as we said in the, the abstract for this, we all have a set of common challenges and really the question that we want to explore together here, and this is not gonna be a session where we answer this question, it's gonna be a session where we frame and kick off a conversation that will start today and continue ongoing on how can we work together to box up, that's hence cohort in a box, the things that are shareable, the things that are reusable, so each cohort can focus on their unique needs and not have to reinvent the wheels. Next slide. So what we want to do today over about 20 minutes to leave five to 10 minutes for Q&A is go through and frame exactly that question, go through a checklist of what we see as the main steps that every cohort has to work through, talk through a case study of how the All of Us Research Program is answering exactly those questions. How have, how have we checked and are we checking those boxes? And then start to use that as a basis to generalize and say what could be in the reusable box and how does that lead to a big picture that meets all of our goals together. Next slide. So when we think about streamlining the path to cohort success, the, the obvious, uh, you know, warning, warning metaphor heavy set of slides here on uh, a, a set of images here on this slide, we want to avoid every cohort having to reinvent the wheel, which has local benefits to each cohort in efficiency and in letting you all focus on what's important to you, to your cohort, uh, and instead move to a world where we can build on the expertise of others and work together, which has global benefits in a allowing cohorts to play nicely with each other, which gets to the opportunity that we're all here to further understanding and knowledge of humanity as a whole. Uh, and it also helps to level the playing field and helps the cohorts that are from uh, more funding friendly environments share the benefit of some of what they've done with people who are in more funding challenged environments. And again, get to where we all went together. Next slide. So, as we go through the checklist, next slide, what we want to do is we broke it down into these eight steps of that we think pretty much every cohort program, one way or another, goes through these, where there's a set of steps um, around planning the work uh, and then a set of steps around actually doing it. So next slide. So the first step, which is very uh, specific to each cohort, is why are you in? Why are you doing this? What are you here for? What are your uh, values as a cohort program? What is it that you are trying to achieve? Understand that. That obviously comes first. It, it's uh, the, the end product of that might be short, but it's short and seminal and affects everything else. From those overall mission and values, next slide, then we and every other cohort needs to say, well, let's break it down into the value propositions for our stakeholders. And in particular, what's in it for participants? It's usually some combination of what's in it for each participant as an individual, what's in it for the participant communities that they belong to, for people that they feel part of or like them, and then what's in it in, in a global altruistic sense, what's in it for the world. And that's that. those are the, the, the areas that you usually choose from participant phase facing value, but also researcher facing value. What questions are you trying to help? What researchers answer and what data do you need to do that? Once you've defined those why questions, next slide, we can get into the, the policy questions. And those, again, typically break down into a set of participant facing policies around participants agreeing to consenting to 
appropriate use of their data so that they everyone is clear on as data is collected what it's for and researchers agreeing to the converse and matching set of policies around what they may do with the data and that include putting in guidelines for working with the data both within your cohort and in the global context across cohorts next slide given the policies and goals, you now can get into the, the, the nuts and bolts of defining a data roadmap. What kind of data are you collecting? How are you going to collect it for tissue that you're collecting? What assays are you going to run? What mix of one-time collection versus ongoing longitudinal data are you going for? That roadmap then becomes uh, the chart for the actual next steps. So next slide. Now that we've laid out what we want to do, we get into the actual execution. You recruit participants using some mix of direct outreach and working with partnerships. Typically in recruiting participants, you have to think obviously about consent, but you wanna keep in mind diversity. You wanna keep in mind, how are we going to keep people engaged, especially to the extent you want longitudinal data? What's the plan to have the first touch be the first of many touches so that people feel part of the program in a way that means that they will continue to contribute data. Next slide, once you have people, you have to actually collect the data. The mechanisms of collecting data vary tremendously with the data types. It's obviously a very different set of things you do to collect answers to a survey than to collect, uh, collect tissue samples, both blood and other tissues, uh, to run the assays, to ingest external data, but there's a, a set of work to get the data in. Next slide, which then sets you up to be able to get the data ready by uh, organizing it, harmonizing it, cleaning it, aligning it with, with whatever standards and protocols you've agreed on up front, checking that the data is indeed what you think it is and, uh, and, and figuring out the cadence on which you want to release your data. Uh, from a researcher point of view, if you were to release the data every day, that would be way too noisy. But if you were to release it every five years, that would be way too slow. So what balance of data release is appropriate for your researcher goals? To get curation right, there are feedback loops, uh, both upstream and downstream, where you want to, look, based on the data you've received, sometimes feed back to the data collection process, and then based on what researchers are doing with the data, that may inform uh, in better curation that you can do. Next slide. So now we get to the research end goal of the whole process, which is we've decided on our goals, our policies, we've put together our roadmap, we've collected, we've recruited people, we've collected the data, we've gotten the data ready for research, and now we have to make it useful to researchers. And that typically involves some set of tools that you give researchers to help them use your data, some set of researcher support and training and documentation to help them know how to use your data, and then some amount of scientific validation to just confirm that your data and your tools and your environment are indeed able to answer the kinds of questions that we're, we are uh, working to help researchers answer on their own. Next slide. All right, so we've just gone through it, at a very abstract level, what are the kinds of things that every cohort program has to answer? And Shimon's now going to walk through how is the All of Us research program answering these questions? Many of them have been, some are, are ongoing. So Shimon, hand it to you. Thanks, David. Yeah, so starting off with, you know, the, the four uh, steps here that are, are, you know, planning the, the work that we're going to do, right? It starts with articulating the program's mission and values. Uh, in, in the case of all of us, uh, there's a large investment in building, you know, a one million person cohort of uh, Americans um, with an aim specifically to be a, an incredibly diverse health database. And so, uh, you know, what, um, uh, you know, how we uh, uh, call that out, there are there's some documents uh, linked here on what makes the All of Us program different uh, and our core values that articulate those uh, answers for the benefit of uh, the program participants and other stakeholders. Next up is defining stakeholder value propositions. So again, these focus on the diversity aspect where you know, for participants is a chance to represent uh, a diverse range of uh, communities in health research. Um, there are also value propositions for participants around return of results, meaning that they get uh, you know, useful um, insights from their genomic data uh, delivered back to them uh, and you know, engaging with their communities. Uh, for the researchers, right, the, the diversity is, uh, again, a research uh, resource um, that makes it, uh, you know, distinguishes this data set from others. Uh, it's, of course, got incredible scale and a combination of many different data types. Um, 
where we can see those represented uh, is in uh, sort of the, the dual home pages of the program. So on the left, you see the joinallofus.org website, which is the site uh, for participants who are considering joining. Uh, on the right, you see researchallofus.org, which is the website for researchers. So this is just you know the, the current manifestation of these value propositions. Next up, it's uh, creating data policies. So uh, in, in the case of all of us, um, we made a, a decision to release the data in different tiers. So there's a registered tier and a controlled tier. Slightly higher uh, you know, level of access and, and vetting is required for access to the controlled tier. Uh, and we use a passport style uh, data access model where uh, based on the researcher's uh, own credentials, you know, they have to have an institutional affiliation, they have to complete some training, um, the, you know, they have to sign an agreement. Uh, once they complete those steps, they have essentially the passport to access the data for any number of projects that they wish to start. Uh, looking at the data roadmap, um, you know, I'll, I'll sort of take a point in time, look at where we are today with, uh, you know, the release of electronic health record data, uh, genomics data derived from whole genome sequencing and array sequencing, wearables data from uh, participant provided Fitbit information, uh, and other participant provided information, uh, such as surveys. Um, coming next, we're expanding the, the range of uh, genomic data types, including uh, long read sequencing. Uh, we're deepening the EHR data that's included. Um, this includes both uh, you know, incorporating more record types from uh, EHR data received from our healthcare partners and uh, letting users uh, upload their own EHR data from, from other institutions, uh, as well as things like environmental data. This is, this is an ever-expanding uh, ambition for the program. So, um, you know, here is where we can see sort of the manifestation of that data roadmap. Uh, we have on that researchallofus.org site um, the, uh, the visual on the left is uh, what's called a data snapshot that shows our you know, recruitment over time, uh, number of participants who've enrolled in total, a number who've completed certain critical initial steps. And then on the right, you see our data browser, which is a publicly accessible tool that lets anyone explore you know, what, what types of data are available at uh, essentially what sample sizes. Now switching into the operational side of these, uh, these eight steps, um, how do we recruit participants? So, you know, all of us has uh, funded partnerships with numerous healthcare providers. Uh, you know, this is the, the NIH supporting uh, these different healthcare providers in recruiting and engaging uh, participants. And then uh, those healthcare providers um, bring data in. And this is where we come to the focus of the Data and Research Center, which is the part of the All of Us program uh, that, that David and I are, are most closely uh, involved in. Uh, you know, our mission in the Data and Research Center is to take the data in, organize it, and make it useful for researchers. So that's these, these last three steps. Um, to get it all in, we have a, a software component called the Raw Data Repository, which is just a collector from uh, data from, you know, their healthcare partners, the biobank, the genome centers, and any other uh, organizations that are collecting data that uh, is part of this study. Next up is the curation step where we transform the data from the raw data repo to standardized uh, research data products that come out once or twice a year. Uh, we started out about twice a year. We're, we're actually studying now to about one release per year uh, as, as the you know, number of different data types uh, is, is expanding at perhaps a less frequent rate. Uh, and the goal here is you know, to provide researchers a standardized, easy to use uh, research product. Uh, and last step here is enabling data access. So the DRC operates uh, the All of Us Researcher Workbench, which enables any researcher to create an account and access and analyze the data in a secure cloud environment. Um, here's a, a little animation of what you can do there. Researchers can create workspaces, uh, enter some information uh, about what kind of uh, study or research they're going to do. Uh, analyze the data using a variety of tools, including uh, you know, a cohort builder that, that is uh, customized to this data, as well as standard tools such as Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, and uh, you know, they can also access resources like our, our help desk uh, if, if they need any assistance. 
All right, thank you. So we've gone through a checklist. We've gone through an example of filling out the checklist. And now the question is, where is their leverage? So next slide, just in one slide, this is starting to frame the conversation that we're hoping to get to. Uh, that unfortunately, the uh, the screen, screen uh, aspect ratio is blocking a little bit there, but I know what it's trying to say at the bottom. Um, Shimon, maybe go out of full screen for a second and see if that, that helps. Go back, yeah, just Let me see. try that. Yeah. Is that okay. okay? That, yeah, that's fine. We'll, we'll do that for this slide and then we'll present again when we move on. So when we thought about these eight steps and thought about, hey, where is their potential for maximal reuse versus where is their potential? And these are the rows marked below for sharing knowledge and best practices. Talking to peers is obviously always helpful, but you're going to end up as your cohort doing your own work on many of these steps. So for example, for articulating your mission and values, defining the value propositions for your stakeholders, those are very cohort specific. For the mechanics of recruiting people in your environment, in your communities, for your goals and actually collecting data from them. That also is very cohort specific. Lots of opportunity in that this whole, uh, this whole summit is an example of that to talk to and share best practices and understandings, but the work is, is cohort by cohort. We think around curation, there starts to be an opportunity to reuse actual uh, actual code and other technical artifacts around what are uh, pipelines that's, that one cohort has used to take raw data in this format and put it into another format. For genomic data, what are the, the transformations from reads into variants and annotated variants? For, uh, for uh, EHR data, what is the formatting and, and aligning that's being used? So we think there are opportunities to share there. We think the biggest opportunities, and we think most of the value from a box that allows you to you know, quote unquote, just add participants and end up with a high value cohort program, come in the three rows marked as high here. So first around data policies, there's a whole session later today, a policy starter pack session that goes specifically into are there reusable actual policy artifacts that can help that can have been developed once and used by many cohorts or used mostly intact at least? And we think there's a lot of opportunity there. Around the data roadmap, the specifics of what data are we going to collect? What protocols are we using to run assays? What questions are we asking in surveys? How are we doing this in a way where we can normalize across, uh, across populations? We think there's a lot of opportunity to share there. And then finally, on the last step that Shimon was talking about with the researcher workbench, we think that as a set of software artifacts, there's a lot of opportunity to take a researcher workbench that was built for one environment and use it across many environments so that all researchers get the benefits of ongoing enhancement. Uh, when we set out to build the All of Us researcher uh, Workbench. We built on the Terra platform, and as such, we've 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 learned how to take a platform built for one environment and use it in others. And we think there's a lot more potential to share that more widely across more cohorts. And that's part of what we're uh, the conversation that we're hoping to kick off here is how do we build the box, leaning probably most heavily on the high and medium sections here to get to the goals of reuse and, and exchange. So let's go back to full screen and, uh, and, and bring this to the end. So we've we've talked about the overall uh, the, the overall shape here. Next slide. Uh, so now big picture. We are all sub cohorts of 8 billion. If you uh, click next uh, one more time, I've been thinking a lot this week. It's been Thanksgiving in America. I've been thinking about family a lot. And there's a it's fairly easy to see that we are all part of one eight billion strong human family. And every one of the cohorts we're working on is is drilling in to a subpopulation of this one global family, this one global cohort. And we think that in addition to the efficiency and the local benefits of being able to reuse expertise and tools from one cohort to accelerate another, as we do this together, we have this huge global opportunity to really understand together at scale what can we do to understand 8 billion people and use it to improve the health and lives of 8 billion people. And we think that, that as we uh, coordinate our work, that we will make that closer to real. Next slide. 
So uh, just to queue up conversation, if we go to next steps, we think that there's an opportunity to hear from all of you about what parts of this vision resonate the most. Where do you say, wow, I, if, that, if that were available to me, that would be, I would use that tomorrow. If, if somebody were able to package up this or provide that tool in a reusable way, that would save me time, get me to achieve my mission more quickly. And what parts don't? What parts do you say, no, that's interesting, but you know, thank you very much. We've got that under control and we just as soon keep, keep doing it our own way. So we'd love to hear more about that. We'll start that conversation today and continue it. From that, we think there's a conversation to have with the IHCC on saying, let's get going on building those high priority pieces of the box. Let's get going on saying, let's package up the reusable things that are indeed reusable. Um, and, and where can the IHCC focus on that? Where can we expand existing IHCC work streams? Where can we uh, provide the implementation and adoption support? What are the resources that will be needed to do that? And, and doing this all, closing, closing thought here, by keeping our eyes on the prize, how can we build uh, research assets that represent 8 billion people to benefit 8 billion people? So with that, we're going to open it up to, uh, to audience q and I think we officially have five minutes. We're happy to go a little bit long if people want. Uh, and I think we'll start with Jeff. Thank you for, uh, for kicking things off. We'll start, uh, I, will, uh, I, I think it's easiest if I just read Jeff's question out loud. So I'll do that and then uh, Shimon and I can answer it. So Jeff asks, do you envision a web platform that hosts the documents, policies, surveys, and other tools? If so, should we do the experiment and create, perhaps on the IHCC website, a set of resources for other cohorts to access with appropriate links and people contacts and build from there based on utility? Uh, my answer is, I think so. Uh, that sounds right. That's what I expect will be a great starting point. And I think that, uh, you know, as always in launching a new product, and I think of this, this kit and platform and box as a product, uh, start, I'd start by listening to the users and so finding out if we build it, will they come? And saying, uh, and I think an example is there might be a section on that website, which is the policy starter pack. And what would be the artifacts that would go there? There might be a section which is the data roadmap and what are the artifacts that go there. There might be a section uh, uh, around tools, which would be pointers to tools that are usable. But yes, I think a very good start is to provide that catalog and contact points around the things that people are most interested in. Um, uh, so the next question is from Jenya. Uh, the question is, uh, and Shimon, I'm going to give this one to you because I think this is probably, uh, this is a very cohort specific question. So sure. I think we can answer it for all of us. Uh, and the question is, I'm curious, what type of participants uh, can access these data and tools? Uh, would an industry player be able to enter as a participant? And I, I think Shimon, participant and researcher, you might want to define how we use it, but why don't you answer that for us? Yeah. I'll answer it, yeah, with a, with a couple of potential interpretations of, of that word participant. So, you know, the, the in the in the classic uh, sense that we use in, in the All of Us program, you know, participants are people who uh, volunteer to uh, donate their data to uh, to the study. You know, they they're the ones uh, from whom uh, biosamples are collected and, and sequenced and so forth. Uh, in the case of All of Us, uh, a lot of the uh, sort of deliberate recruitment comes through, um, you know, community organizations, hospital partnerships. Uh, or healthcare provider partnerships and, and community partnerships uh, around the United States uh, that are actually specifically designed to oversample groups that are historically less represented in biomedical research. Uh, so there, there is that level of recruitment in terms of who can join. Uh, it, it is true that anyone can actually go to joinallofus.org and sign up for, uh, any American can sign up for the All of Us study uh, there. Um, there's no exclusion on you know, industry involvement as a participant in, in that level. I think there's also the question of, okay, can, can an industry um, uh, representative um, access the All of Us data set uh, as a researcher? Um, the answer to that in the, in the long term is yes. In the short term, we have not yet worked that out. So we, we do aim to make the All of Us resource available um, internationally and to people in a variety of, uh, of research uh, uses. Um, I think that's again, though, a decision that you know should be made on a per cohort level, uh, and there can be different tools for access control that might be reused. But fundamentally, those decisions belong to the, the cohort. And uh, I guess um, 
uh, third in, third interpretation might be who can participate in terms of accessing the you know the tools in the cohort in a box you know tool set. Uh, there, I think uh, we would want those tools to, to be fairly open. Uh, you know, I, I think it's much more to be gained from having the tools reused than to think about trying to exclude anyone. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Uh, Philip Audala asks, is the architecture of the All of Us box, and I think here I'm, I'm mostly thinking about the researcher workbench, the, the step eight, uh, is that architecture very different from that used by UK Biobank or Genomics England? Strength or weakness comparisons? It's a good question. I'd say at a high level, meaning what problem is it trying to solve? Very similar. It's trying to, to say, take the data we have collected and make it available and useful to researchers. Uh, and some of the tools that you can use in all of those environments are similar because the, the, uh, the researchers and the research are similar. I think there are lots of differences in the details. I'm, I'm not going to try to do a, a full breakdown of strength or weakness. There's differences in uh, what sort of tools are available and how easy it is to use them. There's differences in what what it takes to get access, which lines up with the missions of the different programs. There's differences in the, the controls around data exfiltration and what sort of, uh, how easy it is to, to bring data in or out of the environment, which is reflecting different policy differences. Um, but I think that at, at the conceptual level, they're very similar. And then I think part of the opportunity here is to say, which of them, uh, can, can, how can they all contribute to something that is maximally reusable? Um, and we've done some early work on looking at how do you, what does it take to do cross analysis across some of these cohorts? And it's, it's uh, harder than it should be today. And I think that's one of the opportunities. Uh, moving on, uh, in the interest of time, Cindy uh, Lolly says, uh, what resonates for me, uh, David and Shimon, is the opportunity to quickly summarize the value proposition for cohorts to help pitch use of the cohort to potential funding bodies, industry or academic. Is this something that can be enabled in the scope of this project? I think the answer is yes. Uh, that's great to hear. Thank you for that, that for answering that what resonates question. Um, I think that that would, uh, I had, I think I had marked that row as low potential, but I'm glad to hear that it would be valuable because I think it is one of the easier things to capture and document. Every cohort has already uh, done that because they have done their own pitches uh, and to capture that and say, here's at least a menu of value propositions that have worked in other environments from which a new cohort can uh, mix and match what works in their environment makes a lot of sense. Uh, Ricardo asks, this may be our last question, but if there was one more pops up, we'll take it. Ricardo asks, uh, although getting stakeholders on board may not be reusable, can you tell us how that was done for all of us? What was key to its success? Can general guidelines be derived from that experience? Um, I don't know how general. Uh, let me think, let me answer the specific question and say that this came out of originally um, the NIH exploring the idea of precision medicine and the NIH saying, how can we as a national body whose mission and mandate is to uh, advance health, how can we and what should we be doing as an institution around precision medicine, organizing a working group to put together a report on exactly that question and provide advice to the director of the NIH, who was Francis Collins at the time, and that precision medicine working group put together a long report with a lot of suggestions and recommendations. And the, the, one of the key recommendations was to create a cohort program, to create a national cohort program, and then uh, several years of work to refine that and turn it into um, turn it into uh, an actionable plan. Uh, it was mentioned by then President Obama in one of the State of the Union uh, addresses as a, a one of the commitments moving forward. So it was a long, uh, slow, slow but critical consensus building approach to line up the resources to support what was seen as a high value opportunity. Um, all right, I think we are going to uh, wrap up now. Uh, we can answer more questions offline as they show up on the platform. Thank you all for your time. Uh, and we look forward to continuing the conversation and building some boxes together. Thanks. Thanks everyone.